Molweni, my name is Wuanga Mbeia and I am from South Africa. I stay in the coastline of Bebeja and my love for seaweed started when I had the opportunity to study about it in Sweden, Gothenburg University. I live between uh, Paris and Brittany in France. Brittany is the west coast of France and probably the most complete seaweed ecosystem in the country. Seaweed is actually part of our daily life in China. My favorite seaweed is kelp. I am a seaweed ambassador for an organization called Safe Seaweed Coalition. The coalition is a partnership that supports the safe and sustainable scaling up of the global seaweed industry. I do believe in the absolute need of a program of advocacy uh, based on dialogue and communication towards these various stakeholders and communities. I'm a graduate student at the University of Victoria in the Spectral Lab, uh, where we map and monitor bull kelp using remote sensing. What piqued my interest the most was the fact that seaweed grows very fast and through photosynthesis it absorbs carbon dioxide at a phenomenal rate. Now this process, also known as carbon sequestration, could be our answer to global warming and to mitigating the effects of climate change. And again, we want to move this industry forward. I really think seaweed has the potential to not just help our eco and ecosystems and biodiversity in the ocean, but also to help the communities along these coastlines. I'm really hoping that seaweed can provide quality, sustainable jobs. I have discovered a special formula to transform seaweed into a pliable material to create fashion and home decor products. I like to draw parallels between land-based agricultural systems that I'm familiar with and the seaweed industry that's developing and growing. So I think it's really important that we have um, a lot of people talking and thinking about kelp how to monitor it, how to restore it, uh, and just really recognizing the importance of our kelp forest. Well, I kind of came up with the saying, whatever the question is, seaweed is the answer, and that's not exaggerating. From food to biofuels, to bioplastic, to biofiber. And I eat it, I dry it, and I put in all my dishes. I love to tell others about seaweed because it holds so much promise to support our global food systems and sustainability more broadly. My advice to anyone wanting to know about seaweed is get involved, be a part of it, be a part of this amazing industry. Because of all this and more, I'm driven to spread the word about the multifaceted treasure trove that seaweed is. It's a powerhouse that can contribute significantly to many of the United Nations sustainable development goals. I hope you will learn more of seaweed during seaweed days. And I hope you'll join me in the seaweed revolution. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second season of Seaweed Days. My name is Erin Bremner Mitchell. I'm the manager of communications here at Cascadia Seaweed and on the Seaweed Days planning team. Uh, for now, everyone, your cameras are off and you're, uh, you're muted. This is very helpful during the presentation. Uh, we encourage you to use the chat function though to connect with our team and also if you have a question that pops into your mind during the presentation, please write it in the chat box and um, we will get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Today, I am so pleased to welcome um, Naomi from North Island College. North Island College is a sponsor of CB Days this year and in particular this session. And um, uh, Naomi is the manager of the Center of Applied Research and Technology and Innovation at North Island College. So I welcome you, Naomi. Thanks so much, Erin. It's great to be here. I am so pleased to uh, be able to come here and talk to you all and, and welcome our wonderful guests, um, given that North Island College has been an active research and supporter of seaweed for the last 10 years. And we even have an, a bioreactor here that we've had for many years. And so we are also thrilled to learn more about what is happening with industrial plankton. 
So I'm so pleased now to introduce you all to Robert Rolston, who has founded Industrial Plankton um, in 2010. And Industrial Plankton developed their bioreactors for producing live algae reliably with a focus on maintaining a stable biosecure culture. And so now we are very excited to include Robert in our seaweed sessions. So hello, Robert, and welcome. And hello, Ashley. I see you're there as well. Ashley was also co-founder of Industrial Plankton. Great. All right. Thanks, Naomi, for the intro. So let's start with the screen sharing. All right. Assuming everybody can see this. So thanks for having us, Seaweed Days, of course. And thanks, North Island College and also Cascadia for organizing this wonderful event. Yeah, so I'm Robert Ralston and my sister, Ashley Ralston. We founded Industrial Plankton 12 years ago now. Um, my background is I did a biology degree and then a mechanical engineering degree. Ashley did a business degree, so she kind of got me out of the garage and into, you know, actually getting into the real world. Um, otherwise, I just hide in the back and invent stuff all day. But um, so we started this with a vision. I was incredibly into aquarium fish. I was paying my rent, propagating corals and selling fish I was breeding um, on the marine fish side. So really enjoyed the, uh, the challenge of maintaining artificial environments. And that got us into this. So the vision for our company is to create technologies to address major world problems, food security, greenhouse gases, and ocean acidification. Obviously, there's a lot of other problems with the world, but these are some the biggest ones in my opinion. So we're trying to help address those. We're headquartered in Victoria, British Columbia. Um, right now we have 20 people working here, pounding out bioreactors and shipping them all over the world. So we got interested in seaweed. Well, we'll get into it a little more later, but there's a lot of parallels between microalgae, which we've been working on for the past 12 years intensely, and macroalgae. Um, a lot of it having to do with the controls or the temperature, pH, light, and uh, biosecurity being one of the biggest and more challenging aspects. And so our background is in selling bioreactors to aquaculture hatcheries, particularly shellfish hatcheries and also shrimp hatcheries and uh, marine finfish as well. Um, but in, in the hatcheries, if you have lower quality algae, because of these unstable conditions, if any of these parameters are, are out of whack, then the quality of the algae can go down and the hatchery yield ends up going down. And even if you don't get less survival, the animals coming out of it are just lower quality. And at the end of the day, that cascades a few years down the line into lower yield for your grow up. So it all starts with a, a good foundation. And so that's been the, the whole goal of everything we've done is to provide aquaculture hatcheries with the right foundation um, to ensure their success, or at least let them focus on the other major problems that they have, which anyone who's run a hatchery knows that there's quite a few. So we started off in 2011, we developed a 700 liter prototype of our algae bioreactor. Then we scaled that up to a thousand liters, uh, improved the control system, sold a number of these from 2012 to 2016. And then five years ago, we upgraded this system again um, to LED lights and uh, much better controls and water filtration and improved biosecurity. And at this point, we've sold over 200 of these systems to 22 countries, and we're supporting probably half the farms in, uh, in North America that are producing shellfish, which is pretty significant. And in the early days, there was a lot of pushback from industry. Um, they're saying, oh, well, we already know how to grow algae. Why do we need this? And so it took a while to get a foothold in the market, but now that people realize how nice it is to have a an automated biosecure system pumping out their algae so that they can focus on growing their animals and not actually growing their algae. Um, we're starting to get a significant market share and we've been growing at over 30% a year for the past six years. So it's been really taking off. So how we got into the macroalgae side, um, anyone who's into seaweed, well, You've likely heard of Scotland Daly has a, a bunch of TED talks on seaweed and he's one of the US's uh, foremost seaweed research scientists. 
and uh, he works at Wood Soul Oceanographic Institute uh, in Massachusetts. And he was bugging me for a couple of years because he saw what we were making and he said, the industry needs this to guarantee seed supply, et cetera. Um, so he said he needs a gametophyte production system and a, a system for sporophyte induction. So after you grow the gametophytes, you have to combine them, change the parameters a bit and have them actually, uh, well, they call it being induced into gametogenesis, but yeah, the words the words get kind of annoying because of gametes and gametogenesis and et cetera, but either way, you grow the gam, <laughs> the gametophytes and then induce them into um, becoming gametes. So the gametophyte production system parameters, so you need to control temperature, uh, which is yeah really important for kelp, of course, pH, uh, because it's a plant, and light intensity, uh, you can easily photo inhibit and, uh, any kind of plant if you just blast it with too much light too quickly. Um, the spectrum, which is extremely important for gametophytes, uh, the photo period, circulation, the blending frequency, and the biosecurity. And so the blending frequency, you can see in this picture, it's essentially an immersion blender. Uh, when the gametophytes grow, they start to branch out, but you can just continue to grow them vegetatively if you just keep blending them up um, on a regular interval. So you just keep them small and they will just keep growing and growing. And then the biosecurity, which is a key component to any kind of cell culture. And this is something we've run into pretty often with farms because most of the farming doesn't require that level of biosecurity, but at the very beginning stages, you're essentially doing cell culture and it's, it's closer to biotech than it is traditional farming. And so uh, we've gotten good at explaining, yeah, cell culture biosecurity to farmers in countries all over the world. In North America, it's, our biosecurity is quite good, but you go some other places like, um, well, I won't name countries, but there's places where they, they don't have as high a regard for biosecurity. So after I agreed to build these for Scott Lindell, uh, we built him three systems. Uh, one of them, so you can grow female gametophytes in one, male gametophytes in the other one, and then combine them together in the third one um, to induce them into becoming sporophytes eventually. Um, some of the big points for it, uh, something he couldn't do before was in situ blending. So he was actually removing his gametophytes from how he was culturing them, blending them up, or you know, literally putting an immersion blender into his cultures. Um, but anytime you open it up to the outside world, you're almost guaranteed introducing contaminants. Uh, yeah, so we can actually do this in a, in a sealed vessel, and you can autoclave the entire thing between culture runs. Um, so there's no exposure to the outside world. We also have spectrally controlled LEDs, so you can just punch into the touch screen, whatever spectrum you want, and it will uh, yeah, come out as that, and you can control the intensity of that spectrum as well. Uh, another feature is we've sealed it to the external light so that you don't have stray light coming in and inducing the gametophytes. And since you generally grow them under red light, and then when you want to induce them, you blast them with some blue light, and then it induces them. Uh, we also, for biosecurity, use a lot of the same features. Um, these are essentially just miniature bioreactors of what we've been building for the past 12 years. So micron filtration for the air and the media and vent filter, um, similar to what you do with cardboard. Uh, there's also a way to harvest biosecurely so you can pull liquid out of the, out of the system uh, without introducing external contaminants. And as I mentioned, the entire system is fully autoclavable. So um, you autoclave it all assembled and you never open it up and expose it to external contaminants. Um, another interesting feature of the system is the touchscreen control and data logging. So you can tell how your culture is doing ahead of time. Uh, it has, so it logs your light intensity, the spectrum you're using, the temperature, the pH, the CO2 being consumed, which is actually a really nice analog for growth you can tell let's say you turn the lights up too fast and then the co2 consumption drops off you can actually tell very quickly that you've just photo inhibited your culture or if you change the 
you know, any parameter and the CO2 consumption drops off, that just means it's growing less quickly. And so you can, as opposed to waiting a few days and starting to see it change color and doing those um, kind of qualitative checks that people often do, um, this gives you more real-time feedback. But in addition to that, you can go back any extent of time over the past you know, several months or years, et cetera. And if you have recorded your harvest rate, you can, you can actually tell, okay, at these parameters, this is when it was doing extremely well. So it really helps you fine tune the system and the, the gametophyte yield you're getting from the system. And you can also track the, the blending regime because a lot of these things, when we were starting to work with Scott Lindell, he wasn't sure of all the parameters. So we just gave him enough levers to pull in either direction and it records what he's been doing. And so he can go back in time and tell what was successful and what wasn't. Um, because anyone who's done experiments, you go back a few months and you might not have the best notes. I'm not the most thorough person. So we get the control system to record everything. And it's also nice because you can log in remotely. So if you made some changes and you go home for the night, you can check on your phone and make sure everything's going well. And actually make adjustments as well. Yeah, so the results from running these, uh, this three pack of 10 liter systems at Woods Hole, uh, he achieved a density of 14 grams per liter of wet weight. So wet weight being um, vacuumed to remove any external water, but obviously there's still water in the cells because you're not gonna put those in the oven because you need to use them. Um, whereas microalgae, you generally deal in dry weight, but um, seaweed people seem to prefer wet weight as a measurement. So 14 grams per liter of wet weight is what he achieved. And the picture on the screen is uh, a picture of his tank, which is nice and thick with gametophytes. Uh, when he was inoculating, so at the lower densities, he was achieving a growth rate of 5% uh, growth per day. And then once it got up to the, the high densities, um, he got one of those tanks, he got up to, I believe, over 130 grams um, of actual wet weight within the tank. So at that point, it was the growth was more approaching 2.5%. So it started to taper off a bit uh, at the very high densities. And he was directly seeding rope with these and using 15 milligrams wet weight per meter of rope that he seeded, which came out to 960 meters for every liter. So roughly a thousand meters. So roughly a kilometer per liter of gametophyte culture um, in terms of the biomass in the tank. But you can also, so that's if you're just using what's in the tank, but if you're doing a harvest over the course of a month, say partial harvest, so you could harvest 25% and then let it grow up to full again over the next week. Um, so if you stretch out your harvesting from the gametophyte system over a month, um, you can get it up to somewhere around two kilometers per liter um, currently. So, And there's likely optimizations to be made on that since this was, you only did a few runs, uh, but either way, that's a, a nice round number to have in your head. So. For every liter of gametophyte culture, you can seed roughly two kilometers of rope. Obviously, you need a chunk of male culture and a chunk of female culture, but in total, it's one liter of culture. Oh, uh, yeah. So this was an interesting hot off the presses thing from Scott Lindell. So we we talked just a few days ago and asked him how his direct seeding went, and he was really excited about it because it actually went really well. Uh, there's a lot of debate from everything I've been reading about direct seeding. And so people talk about various adhesives and different rope material selections and different methods of applying the gametophytes to the rope. And originally they were, they were doing a, a painting method and depending who was doing the painting, they had uh, mixed success. But on his last run, they actually just directly sprayed the induced gametophytes. So not straight out of the gametophyte tank, but he put them in the in the induction tank for let's say a week. And after they've been induced, then he was directly spraying them on the rope. And he actually achieved harvest comparable to the nearby commercial farms. So from just direct spray on the rope, he was able to achieve 10 kilograms per meter of harvest yield from those ropes. Um, and the other interesting thing is he just sprayed them on his words were he sprayed them on at two in the afternoon and at four in the afternoon, they were in the water on the farm and 
that's what resulted in his 10 kilograms per meter. So that was all very encouraging because before that we weren't quite sure. It's like, okay, we can make a ridiculous amount of gametophytes, but it's not gonna do anybody any good if they can't actually get them on the ropes. But um, at least from his initial trial, he had very good success with this. So that's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, and so the re what I didn't understand when I started all of this was the difference between the traditional method of seeding ropes and what he's actually doing. And so traditionally you go out and you collect chunks of the frond with the spores on it and you bring them back and you clean them as best you can. And then you let the spores pop and then you put those in with your, your twine, your spools of twine and you let them attach to it over the course of whatever weeks or months. Um, as opposed to the direct seeding method where you just grow a ton of gametophytes and you induce them and then you just spray them on. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but traditionally they're introduced into the twine around the zone and we're actually introducing them after the induction phase. And so we can stay in this gametophyte phase and just vegetatively grow as many gametophytes as we want in these bioreactors. So you, know, you can start with one gram and end up with 100 grams of gametophytes and you can harvest 95% of them that production season and then just grow that five grams that's left up to another 100 grams for your next season. So um, it just lets you continuously produce the same strain of uh, gametophyte. Uh, so after that, we developed actually a smaller system. Um, the 10 liters, we started to realize that 10 liters was actually a considerable amount of gametophyte output for the average size farm these days. And we'll offer the 10 liters as, as a product, but I think the smaller ones are actually a more suitable size, um, especially in terms of maintaining genetic diversity. Uh, so we developed these two liter systems they're small modular refrigerated systems, just easy access for ergonomics and uh, biosecure, of course. And recently we sold a 16 pack of these systems to researchers on the East Coast of Canada. Um, so these are going to be delivered in the next couple of weeks. They're mostly built right now. And so as you can see, it's just as many systems as you want. They're modular, so you just Buy them and they all tack on to the original control system. So once you have a control system, you can just bunk on as many of these as you want. Um, so in this case, it's a 16 pack system. So 12 of these are for gametophytes and four of them will be for sporified induction tanks. And this is where it becomes really interesting for a selective breeding because you can have in this system, so you'll have six males and six females going at the same time and you can cross in any way you want those, those six. And then you take them out to the farm, you grow them for a year, you see what results you get, and you can come back and you can still have that same genetic strain going. And you can know that tank one mixed with tank eight gave you a result that was twice as good as the other ones. And you can go back and then try to combine that with some new things. And as you know, those are your, those are your good ones. And Scott Lindell actually did a study on this as well. I saw a talk he gave down in San Diego. And yeah, some of his crosses, um, just from his F1 cross, you know, they outperformed the average by, don't quote me on it, but it was something like double. Like some of them were just extremely better than other ones. And so there's a lot of work to be done on selective breeding. And given a number of small systems like this, gives a lot of flexibility for that. Um, so this is another project that we're completing. So we've developed a turnkey hatchery. And so this is being delivered to Sea Forest, which is a local company doing kelp production. Um, so it of course has a bank of our seaweed bioreactors or SBRs, um, but it also has a small lab to do the sterile cell, cell culture transfer. So we have a laminar flow hood and an autoclave, as well as some fridges to maintain uh, a library of stock cultures and just convenient benches and sinks to do your dissection of uh, actual kelp that you pull in from the ocean, et cetera. Um, yeah, so this is just a turnkey system that will produce gametophytes. Oh, and one other feature 
you can just turn red lights on. So essentially like one of those old photo development rooms, um, just so you don't mess up your, your gametophytes um, if you're working on them. Yeah, so selective breeding. But the last point is one of the most important one, legislative barriers. So this one's a bit out of my hands. Um, yeah, I was speaking just before this uh, to Cascadia and they were mentioning they've adopted a 50 kilometer uh, radius in terms of where they get their genetic stock from to where they replant it just to maintain genetic diversity. And so there's a, a whole world of questions around that, uh, which I won't be able to answer, but in general, there's a huge potential for selective breeding. Even if you do it in certain pockets, you can still take the genetic material from one pocket or geographic zone and cross that and improve it. And if you have a lot of tanks, then you can maintain genetic diversity. But yeah, that's a, a much bigger question. Uh, but it tends to be what's making aquaculture cost effective. Uh, we've been going to conferences for years and just talk, talking to the shrimp farmers and watching their presentations. Over the past 10 years, uh, the shrimp that they're harvesting for farms has doubled in the actual farm gate size. And so, that lets the farmers get a lot more out of their infrastructure. Um, so their amortized capital costs gets diluted by that doubling of production they're actually getting. And the shrimp are actually worth more because they're bigger and et cetera things. And then the other thing compared to comparing seaweed to land crops, I mean, land crops, we've been selectively breeding them for thousands of years and seaweed, like right now we just put it in the ocean and then we go and collect it again. and just kind of start at the same point every year. So we're not making any progress on that. So I, I do see a lot of opportunity there. Um, and it's not just for overall yield. Um, you can also selectively breed, of course, for things like stress tolerance. Uh, if you're in an area that might have variable seawater temperatures or rising seawater temperatures, and you can help breed one that's more resistant to high, high ocean temperatures. And then another thing that uh, Scott Lindell was doing was selectively breeding for composition. So he was breeding sugar kelp and going for the ones that have the lowest ash content and, and the highest sugar content. So you're actually getting a higher quality material at the end and more of it. So there's a lot of interesting things to be done in that. Uh, in the future, building gametophyte reactors up to 20 liters. That's simple for us. Is a picture of us with one of our 100 liter algae bioreactors. Uh, but 20 liters is a nice convenient size for putting one of these in an autoclave. We can, of course, go bigger, but we'll see what the industry needs. Uh, but right now, our commercialized size is the two liter version to uh, try to give people a whole lot of individual tanks to do the selective breeding in. And then the other thing that we're really interested in is um, continuing to develop these turnkey hatcheries at any scale since. It's a modular hatchery and it's turned out really well. So um, we'd be available for uh, building those for people as well. So our overall company goal is to help the industry expand rapidly by eliminating seed bottlenecks and facilitating selective breeding. Um, so what we've seen in other aquaculture industries over the years, there tends to be a lot of people who want to get into it and grow it. And then you get a couple bad years with the seed and it just ends up taking 10 or 15 years to really develop an industry as opposed to five. And so if there's just an abundant seed supply, then all the farmers get to work on all the other logistical problems with growing things in the ocean. Um, so there's a lot of other things to optimize. And if you give people a copious amount of seed, you just take that out of the equation and they don't have to worry about it. Uh, so we're interested in working with commercial producers as well as seaweed researchers. So if you're at all interested in talking with me more, feel free to send me an email, robert at industrialplankton.com. That? No, we're good. Yep, and that's the end of our presentation. It's just a picture of the back of our shop, down and out by reactors. All right, thanks. Well, that's just terrific, Robert. Thank you so much. I love seeing those pictures of the bioreactors. Around my office, everyone likes to call them the spaceship. So 
Uh, yeah, we love it. But thanks, that's super exciting, very fascinating. I thought um, hearing about the customization and the real-time optimization is so exciting um, for what might be possible there. And uh, it's got me thinking for sure about how we might be able to utilize that technology here at North Island College. But what I'd love to do is I see that there are a few questions coming in. I've got a couple of direct messages here. So I'm going to roll through a couple of these questions and uh, see how we do. I'm, we've got a bit of time here, so I think we're OK. Um, so here's one. I watched a video on industrial plankton, and I recall something about the Built in Canada program. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, the Built in Canada program is actually how we launched our 1250 liter reactor. So the kind of the latest stage of our LG bioreactor. And that was incredibly successful. Uh, you know, one of those situations where the program is used exactly how it should be. And so we got our first sales of this. We wouldn't have taken that. Play. It was a pretty major step forward that we wouldn't have taken at the time um, without that program. Yeah. And so a couple of different government organizations purchased this uh, our 1250 LG bioreactor through that. So we sold it to them and it essentially paid for the development of it. And since then we've sold another 170 of those. So brought in, I don't know, let's call it $10 million or something to the Canadian economy because of that. So love that program. It worked out great for us and it worked out great for Canada. So yeah, poster children of that program. Oh, okay, terrific, thank you. Do you know, is that program still active? Um, it's changed to Innovative Solutions Canada now. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Okay, just in case anybody's wondering. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's another question for you. It's, is there a way to label the mini reactors with where the parent stock comes from? We're asking this to make sure we protect the genetic diversity of the seaweeds when we outplant in different geographic areas. Yeah, so you can write on the, um, there's a label on the actual glass vessel. Um, just kind of like a standard lab glass vessel, so you can write on it with a sharpie, and right. yeah, and you can also you can also label the little mini fridge that it's built in. But it's nicer to you never know. Maybe somebody changes the glass vessel around, but yeah, you just label it like you would a standard piece of glassware. Um, yeah, so there's a white white spot you can write on on it. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Let's roll through a couple more of these. Um, oh, do your clients normally supply you with the parent material? Um, the parent material? Like, uh, we, we just sell equipment, so we don't, well, occasionally people will send us algae cultures like several times a year if they're curious if we can grow them. Um, and then we'll grow them here and sometimes destroy them. Well, actually, I always destroy them, but either way, sometimes we need to sign something to destroy them, yeah, especially if it's genetically modified. Um, but in general, we don't grow algae too often for other people. We just send them the equipment and they grow it at their site. Right, okay. And then tell us a little bit about where the passion for growing algae came from. Well, How did this all start? It's because I was growing marine aquarium fish and okay. I was killing a bunch of them because I didn't understand at the time, you know, 15 years ago, what omega-3s were and that they're important for early stage development of fish and that the fact that omega-3s all come from algae at the base of the food chain. Like, you know, I didn't know that when you buy cod liver oil and it's got omega-3s in it, those omega-3s started at the algae stage. Um, and so I started buying algae and growing it and then just kept increasing the survival of my fish like, you know, starting with 0% and then ending with 100%. And I was like, oh, this algae thing, there's something to it. Yeah, so it was about enriching zooplankton for my fish that I was growing. Wow. Yeah, and then they were good. They were 30 bucks each, so that's why I was going to pay my rent. <laughs> and you believe seaweed. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how the so. microalgae started. But the seaweeds, like, microalgae is really exciting and challenging and, and great for the aquaculture world. But seaweeds, actually, I've got pages and pages like you know several feet deep of calculations on things that will actually potentially deal with this greenhouse gas problem and seaweed is the only thing out of all those pages that even kind of made sense and so that's why I'm really excited about that and I don't want the industry to take 15 years to get to a point it could get to in six or seven years so we're hopefully going to help ramp it up be part of the solution anyway I 
suspect there's a lot of people joining us on this call who feel similarly. Yeah, seaweed, exactly. seaweed is the answer, or, or at least part of that answer. Yeah, that's really exciting. Okay, let me turn back to my uh, submissions here. Questions. Oh, I love this one because I also um, think this is very relevant for us at NIC. But the example of a turnkey bioreactor station, how much would a system like that cost and how long would it take? Yeah, so for our 1250s, we can give you an answer. What does this cost right now? Um, 63,000 American. Yeah, so 63,000 American for the, the large 1250 systems. Yeah, I can't give you an answer on the small SBRs yet because I want to check our prices after we put this 16 pack. If anyone anyone who's been building stuff over the past year knows how crazy supply chain right. yeah, pricing has been. But yeah, if people get in touch with me, we can give you an answer on pricing within the next couple of weeks. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Okay. And um, what species of microalgae are you currently working with? Oh, we work with so many. Yeah, at this, we've grown at least 30 species. Um, some of the major ones, uh, a number of diatoms, but um, the last year, Sierra West Flogie is a common one, especially for the shrimp people. And then, uh, yeah, isocrisis is really common for the shellfish people. And then the biotech people grow nanochloropsis, hematococcus, mm -hmm. and uh, there's, yeah, tetracelmus, that one's important too. So, yeah, my biologist could rattle off a bit 30 of them that we've grown. If it with. grows well in a carboy, it usually grows well yeah. in the bioreactor. Okay. So, yeah, freshwater or marine, people are doing both. Yeah, there isn't anything that anybody's put in there that hasn't grown yet. So, we'll put it that way. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so lots, lots more questions flowing through. So, this is great. I'm really pleased to see this. So, please keep the questions coming. Um, so here's one. Can you talk more about the chopping or fragmenting of the gametophytes? What is your physical mechanism? Yeah, so it's very similar to an immersion blender that you would purchase. So it's got a long neck and a sharp blade that spins really fast. And yeah, that's about it. And there's some, some details to the blade um, geometry so it slices better. Um, but you don't want to, you don't want to, shear them apart, you want nice, clean slices. Um, so high speed and super sharp blades. And, and does it just have one sharp blade at the bottom that does the- Yeah, yeah, sing, the yeah single blade at this point. So long shaft down near the bottom with a you know single, well, yeah. double-sided blade, so it's balanced. Otherwise it would rattle too much, but. Well, excellent, okay. So, um, she's going to take off because she has a baby. And, you know. <laughs> okay, here's one from Kevin Thompson. Very excited technology, which is what the industry will need to advance. And then he says, did I miss how long it takes to get from plugging it in to ready for planting? So I think it was about a month. It, it really depends on I mean, when you plug it in, it's it's ready to go. So it depends how much starter material you put in. Um, yeah, for example, in our large algae bioreactors, they go really quickly. So we put 20 liters in and 10 days later, you're up at 1200 liters and you're able to harvest 300 liters a day. Um, yeah, so don't quote me on it because I haven't looked at the graphs, but um, you can work it out by the 5% per day growth rate though. Um, so. In the early in the early stages until it gets really dense, it's growing at five percent per day. So it depends how much starter material you put in, and then you can multiply that by one point zero five every day. And you're finding similar growth rates for the seaweeds as you are for, or you did previously for macroalgae or microalgae. Oh no, microalgae is, is considerably higher growth rate okay. sometimes, but yeah, okay. yeah, because okay. microalgae might be fifty percent per day, and, and seaweed is you know, five percent per day. But right. I'm pretty sure we can push that a lot more. They weren't pushing the lights as much as uh, they could have on the last one. So. Okay, so more to come. Um, okay, we still got some time here. So I'm gonna keep plugging through the questions. So Carlos is asking, um, have you given any thought to industrial scale hatcheries for green gravel production? We have talked to somebody about that and I think it's a great idea. So. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. If we can reforest the ocean, I mean, it just makes tons of sense. 
I mean, you're, you still have the urchin problem to deal with. So, uh, I don't know, you might put them in, they might all get grazed down, but in, in areas where that's being alleviated by some other means, the urchin problem, then, or maybe you can just overwhelm them with enough uh, green gravel supply. The urchins can't keep up, hard to say. But yeah, I've given some thought to it and I'm definitely interested in working with people doing that because I think it's got a lot of potential. It's reforest the oceans. You can do it on just such a mass scale, so. Yeah, and exciting not to be using the rope. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Um, so Michelle's got a question here. Can the two leader SBRs talk to each other with settings? Can you control the individual SBRs remotely? Yep. Yeah, completely. So they're all run off a, a central touchscreen control system, and you can access that control system from your computer or from your telephone. So you can log in and you can change settings or then you can see how the graphs are going, see if there's any issues. So if you're away for the weekend, you just check your phone and make sure all the graphs still look like they're going in the right directions. And normally here we just they were running cultures. So just pour a coffee and walk by and look at the screen for literally 30 seconds and like, yep, everything looks good. And then I just keep going. And then the visual check is useful too, because you never know. When, if you're good at growing stuff, the visual check is always useful, but the graphs tell you an incredible amount. Um, so yeah, they don't, uh, the individual tanks don't necessarily talk to each other, but they talk to a central control system um, that controls them all independently. So they can be set to completely different settings from each other. And that's all recorded in the long term, So you know exactly what's been going on. and if tank number 13 was by far your most successful one, you can go back and any length of time and see what parameters you just exposed it to to create that wonderful situation. As opposed to, it's hard to remember all those parameters. It doesn't matter how much you write down because yeah. sometimes you change data like multiple times a day. So. That's so true. And the, yeah, the the interface that, that we experienced is fabulous. So I'm sure, I'm sure that- nice. The new stuff is also really exciting and um, informative. Okay, so let's try and squeeze one more in here. Um, how long does it take for the spores to be ready for planting? How long do they need to spend in the tanks? Yeah, so from speaking with Scott, um, from memory, so don't quote me on it, I believe it was roughly one week. So it takes a bunch of male gametophytes and a bunch of female gametophytes, put them together in the sporified induction tank. Um, or the, the honeymoon suite, as he calls it. And, and then instead of, uh, yeah, so then you turn the red lights off and you turn the blue lights on. And then within a week, you get, we'll say the majority of them that have been induced. And they don't all go like clockwork. So it's like most things, it's a normal distribution. So whatever point you get the majority of them that have been induced. And then, then you use that to start seeding your ropes. Um, so I'm going with one week, but don't quote me on the answer. Well, that's that's terrific. There is there is one question that that leads into. So I'm going to stretch the time just a touch um, because Michelle has asked, has there been any work with keeping males and females in the same bioreactors? You apparently can do it as long as you don't induce them, but um, it's it's probably nicer to keep them separate just for uh, keeping a pure genetic strain. Because um, at the end of the day, like when you really get going, you'd want to grow it out from a single gametophyte into a whole tank and you just have exactly the same of one thing and you know exactly what you're getting. Um, but apparently you can do that, but I have not uh, tried it, so. Okay, well, this is terrific. Um, Robert, I just want to thank you and, and Ashley so much. I found this just fascinating and, and judging by the, the comments and questions that are rolling in here, I think I think I can say that others have also found this so interesting. So we're very excited for, for what you're doing and what might come in the future. So thank Great. you so much for sharing. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. This has been fun to get out of my weird COVID shell and talking to you in a little while. So yeah, likewise, likewise. It's nice, it's nice to be able to do this again. Okay, well, thanks nice. everybody. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. I think Erin's popping back in here. Oh, here she is. Thank you, Naomi, for being an amazing host and Robert for like blowing up our minds with all sorts of ideas on how we can uh, scale up this sector and um, produce a reliable supply of seed. Amazing session. Thanks, everybody, so much.
Well, thank you for organizing us, Erin, and great to see all the interest. So thanks for everyone to show, for showing up. Yeah, we've got a uh, uh, day and a half still left of Seaweed Session, so we'll see you, see you online. Absolutely. Bye.